bridging the gap between ambition and achievement for millennial women. I find that when you're ambitious and you're driven to succeed, you don't let anything get in your way, especially your emotions. And is that good? Is that bad? What does that actually look like when it's actually implemented in a day-to-day -day practice? And so I wanted to originally call this panel compartmentalizing versus coping, but it didn't really look good on the flyer. And it's, <laughs> compartmentalizing is a weird word. I mean, I like the concept, but the word is very weird. weird. Um, but I settled on real term resilience because the term is defined as an, an internal skill to shut down counterproductive thinking and build motivation and focus on the task at hand. Real term resilience is when is used when thoughts are distracting you from an immediate goal or task. Meanwhile, within psychology, compartmentalization is defined as a defense mechanism or a coping strategy. And it's essentially how we're able to deal with conflicting internal standpoints simultaneously. So we talked about the fact that when you're in high school and when you're in school period, you have a note that your, your parents write you if you need to miss class or if you're late or you just feel like you need to just not be at school that day or you know you can fake your note. Either way, you have a note. When you're an adult, there's no notes. And as women, we take on a lot. And some of the, the things that we take on are not quote unquote noteworthy, but they are still significant. We still need to show up and we still need to push through. So I would like to ask the panel, can you share a time when you were just experiencing an emotional day, but still had to push on and push through at work? Uh, a on. I, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer that everything happens for a reason. And so it's really, the reason we're both laughing or we're like during the intro is because I actually emailed Bernice and was like, I don't know that I have a good answer for that whole conversation, but I'm happy to pipe in later. And then today I had kind of a disastrous day. <laughs> And, and so I feel like that was maybe that was the lesson is that you know God was like oh well, I'll give you a perfect I'll give you a perfect answer for Ronisha and for her agenda. So you know I actually had a really stressful day because I had an interview that didn't go well with the BBC this afternoon because they changed the topics they got my intro wrong and they got my intro wrong to the extent where they called me um, they insinuated I was working for a candidate and I'm a journalist which is extremely problematic for my career. So I actually had to leave the interview and immediately call my editor to flag this for him that they made an error on error that went global and that now my editors are gonna have to try to you know figure out how to um, address. And so it was it wasn't a great feeling and I take my job very seriously. Um, but you know life goes on and, and like I can already tell that there's chatter happening you know online because live TV is live TV and especially today things happen in real time. So you know, but it was interesting because my takeaway from it is one, it shows how much I've grown because I'm really close to my mom, so she, she knows I'm coming here tonight. She says hello to everyone. She like, <laughs> knows everything that's happening. But it was really funny because I called my editor first and I called my mother, and she was like, Yeah, this sounds really great because I actually said on air, you got my title wrong, I'm not sure why that happened. And I said, And your producers made an error in terms of the topics because I was not told this is what I was coming to discuss tonight. And I was told it's here to discuss my column, and that's what I'd like to discuss. Now, five years ago, I never would have said that on air because I would have been so afraid of getting asked back. And I worked hard enough to get myself to a place where I can focus on things that are more important to me today, like my respect, my integrity, my value, how I believe I should be treated. And if that means I don't get invited back, I'm okay with that, which I think is a blessing and shows growth. But I also still have to come here tonight and put a smile on. So it's so funny when I rolled in, Dina, who I, I've known and we haven't seen each other in a long time, she could tell that, that I had you know radiation coming off of me, and she's like, we're gonna meditate right now, I'm back here with the music blaring, yeah. and we did, we, we meditated, and I felt myself get calmer, and all of the positive energy emanating from all of you, I, you know, one of the things I'm really trying to get better about, and I know Oprah really pioneered the idea of a gratitude journal, is focusing on all the blessings, and I have so many. And so when I have terrible days like today, I'm trying to, I try to get, that's one of the reasons I was like, I don't know if I can answer these questions. Because I try to get much better at literally saying the words, okay, I'm going to vent about this because I have to, I have to get it out. But gosh, I have a really great life. And so that's why I don't really like dwelling on like, are there days where you have to, because I really try to make myself say, you're allowed a certain amount of time, and then you gotta get up and focus on all the amazing things that are going on. Like, I mean, when push comes to shove, that's not a bad day. I went on the BBC and then I got to come here and speak tonight. Right? There, there are people who have worse problems than mine. So that's what I try to be.
Yeah. So thanks for meditating, which I'm doing more of actually. I think I'm doing more of that. But I, but you see, I, when I got upset today, my first reaction was that let me go meditate. It was like let me call my editor, let me call my mother. And yeah. then I got here, and Dina was like, okay, we're gonna meditate it out, and it worked. So awesome. It was meant to be. I'm glad that Dina was here to do that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. 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 I mean, I, I think that we all, I don't think there's anyone in this room that hasn't had a day, one, just one of those days, right? For women, sometimes it's hormonal for us. That time once a month, that for, I know for me, it's the first or second day, you know? And, and I, it's very hard for me to control my emotions. I think at, at something Kelly said you were talking about five years ago, you wouldn't have done X, Y, Z. So I think, you know, hindsight is 20, 20. You know, I remember when I was in my 20s, I literally wore a lot of my emotions on my sleeve. When I had a bad day, everybody had a bad day. And that was me, and I just didn't care. You know? But as you grow, and you mature, and you realize, uh, I believe in energy transferal, and people pick up your energy when you walk into the room. And if you're a leader, and you're a visionary, that energy, you ever had the boss where you know the boss is in a bad mood, you're like, uh-uh. And it affects the entire energy of the entire of the team, the staff. But a good leader will know there's something I learned. Putting up appearances. Now, there's a certain part of the community that will say, that's your being fake. Mm -mm. It's called being responsible, right? It's called being responsible for your emotions and knowing that your energy and what you're transmitting actually transmits to everybody else and it will bring everybody else down. So if there's anything that I've learned, it's about, okay, shake it off. If I have to look in the mirror at myself <laughs> and give myself a pep talk, like, okay, right here, it's going to be all right. And put that smile on and, and put my head up and shake hands and kiss babies and do whatever I need to do and then go home and cry. It's okay. Hey, guys. Hit the on. Um, yeah, that, yes, me too. Um, I recently had like the worst day and the best day ever happen at the same time. So I, realities, what? Conflicting realities. It was completely surreal. It was like science fiction, like, pick an, which emotion am I going to feel today? So um, I was a magazine editor for real, I'm 40, so all through my 20s and, you yeah, know, we should applaud that. Uh, <laughs> no one would know. Concealer. So when I read her bio, I'm like, she's wearing she was seven. Oh my god. <laughs> All the concealer. So um, I was a magazine editor for a really long time. I was like high, high energy, type A, go, 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 wrote five novels by the time I was 32. Didn't feel any of it. Didn't, don't remember sitting in any of those moments and basking in it or understanding what you know I was accomplishing or um, feeling good about any of it. All I remember is stress and pushing through. And um, then I, I woke up, you know, at 37 and found myself laid off from the magazine I was working at, desperately ill and in hospitals, getting a divorce, having to sell my home, and I like fell off the grid for a couple of years. And, you know, in the past couple of years, I got my life back. You know, I'm working at Bubble now, I wrote my first novel, and you know, like eight years. Um, and I promised myself that this time around, I was gonna breathe and feel everything, okay? Like a grown woman does, you know, before I was a kid, and now I'm an adult, I'm a woman, I'm gonna like sit in these moments and feel them. So my book, The Perfect Fine, hit shelves on April 12th. Um, also on April 12th, so I am the copy director of this global hair care brand, so I'm responsible for the voice of this brand. And we're coming out with this new conditioner. It's not silly when I say it, but I, I had to name it and write the concept for it, and the ad copy will be it. And on the day my book hit shelves, I was also at work giving this presentation of this new conditioner. An hour before that, I had to go to my seven-year-old daughter, I'm a single mother, I had to go to my seven-year-old daughter's school to speak to her teacher about something. We didn't know what it was. So I show up, me and my ex-husband sitting across from each other glaring at each other. And the teacher tells us that our whip smart, interesting, creative daughter has this really sort of devastating reading disability. Mm -hmm. 
that we need to work with now. So, uh, it's the day my book comes out, it's the day I'm giving this presentation, and then I find out this thing about my daughter, and I am devastated. World is over. I have been waiting for this day for this book to drop for 10 years, and now I just want to curl into a ball. And, you know. and then after the meeting, my ex-husband says, um, this probably isn't a good time to tell you, but I'm getting married to my girl. Oh my god. I'm so I get to work, I do my presentation of, of this new conditioner, and someone in the marketing team says, is there a more fun word for conditioner? And I said, is there a more fun word for no? Oh! And then I was like, okay, Tia, okay, all right. So I gather myself and pull myself back together. But a great scene for the next book. Right. Yes. It's all material. It's all material. But in that moment, I was like, you know what? I, okay, this thing happened with my daughter, my ex-husband, uh, whatever. Um, I chose this. I chose all of this. I chose to write this book. I chose to this high power job. I am blessed for all of it. I, you know, we will get through this with my daughter. I divorced this man for a reason. <laughs> Have at it. You know, I, I need to be an adult and own, and own this moment that I'm in. And, and I, it's nobody else's problem that I'm having these, these issues. I can't be rude to marketing. No more. You know? So is this an internal dialogue that's happening and you literally stopped yourself in that moment? No, I wrote it all down. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have to write to myself. You're talking to yourself in the mirror, I would have to write to myself. And, you know, it, it, tur it turned me around. I, I just had to remind myself that these are all uh, things that I have chosen and I need to, you know, put on my big girl panties and deal with them like an adult and not, like, snap at people and be rude and nasty. I'm here because I want to be here. So, I'm gonna laugh. Yeah. Wow, yes, stories, damn. Wow. That's you, all of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, God, I thought I had a, I thought I had bad days, but those were, those were very powerful stories, thank you. Uh, so, I did that, you asked for a day, how about seven years? <laughs> um, so I co-founded a tech company. I've been a TV reporter, worked in TV for a long time, and then uh, went from the old media to new media and co-founded a tech company. And the company started really scaling. Uh, and I was running all the business operations. Uh, and everything was scaling. The number of people, the revenue, the investor dollars, everything, everything except that I just took on more and more and more responsibilities. I went from running one department to running seven departments. All of a sudden we have 75 people, but I have not one person reporting in. To me, I'm expected to do everything in my seven departments uh, and never ask for help. Uh, and side by side with that, I was afraid to be myself in this role. So all of a sudden, is I'm a first time entrepreneur, obviously a woman. Um, there were no other women founders that I knew of in the country of scaling tech companies. This was about uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Uh, and I didn't know how to be myself in that role. I looked around to see all of the really successful founders and they were all men. It's like Peter Thiel from PayPal, and Jeff Bezos from Amazon, and Mark from Facebook. So I thought, okay, I need to channel a male founder if I want to be successful, so I should probably just act like a guy. So I have no idea how a guy would act, but maybe he would be really tough and work all the time. So I was really tough and I worked all the time. And as the company scaled, that did not scale. Like me not being true to myself. And this ended up manifesting into panic attacks. Mm -hmm. So for seven years, I was compartmentalizing so hard that I didn't even acknowledge there was a problem to myself. And yet, I couldn't walk down the street in New York by myself for two years. And I couldn't take the subway. I was having panic attacks constantly. And I don't know if any of you guys have had that, but if you have a panic attack, you think you're about to faint. Um, so I lived in fear of passing out uh, while crossing an intersection in the middle of the street and having a car roll over my body. So I didn't think about it. I just solved the problem. I took cabs everywhere I went on a startup salary. Uh, I had a 12 minute walk to work and I took a cab every day. Uh, $7 there, $7 back, $2,000 a year in taxis. You know, a 12 minute walk. Um, and so one day when I couldn't, so it was November 11, 2011, and I, I had taken a taxi and he drove me on across the street, and I just had to cross the street, and I couldn't cross the street. A lot of my mom get. By the way, I'm like in the press every day, 
held up and says, role model, I'm hosting everything. You know, in fact, I'm like hosting dinner parties, I'm speaking at Davos, like I'm at everything. And I wasn't healthy enough to cross the street. And in that moment, I said, I'm done. I'm just done. I need to live in the opposite part of the world in the opposite way. And I ended up, and we can get to this later, I ended up leaving the company and booking a one-night ticket to Bali and flying six days later and spending two and a half years traveling the world. Nice. But my point in answering your question is that I'm actually, maybe controversially, I'm not at all a fan of compartmentalizing. I think we should bring ourselves to everything. I was at, this morning I was having lunch at someone else yesterday. I was having lunch yesterday, there's someone at the table next to me uh, who I knew a little bit. And he was like, hey, Dina, how are you? Great to see you. And I said, okay, like I'm okay. Because I was okay. okay. Uh, so we can talk about this more, but I am a, I'm a fan of bringing yourself. Yeah. And if you have a bad day, like say it, <laughs> find someone to hold hands yeah. with, and uh, let's bring all of us to everything. Because yeah. I think that compartmentalizing thing can lead to really dangerous things for our bodies. I do want to get back to that. A lot of the things that you just touched on, but I do want to go back to Raki and Tia, what you guys talked about. When you describe those moments, you talked about what happened afterwards and how you talked about it to yourself to to work yourself through it. But when you were actually in the moment, like when you were in the meeting, or when you were having a bad day at work and you were letting everyone feel it, what did that look like and how did you talk yourself out of it or talk yourself away from like actually, you know, maybe breaking down in tears or screaming at everyone at that moment? Well, I clearly didn't because I was an asshole. <laughs> I, I was. I was. I let my emotions completely take over. And I agree with you about compartmentalizing. It isn't the, the best choice, but for me, I find, it, I find it hard to, I don't know how to get through my life if I didn't compartmentalize. Because it is so extreme, the highs of the success of this book, and the intensity of, of my career, and you know the love for my baby, and the, the struggles with what she's going through now. And it's just, too, it's too much for one person to take, you know. And if I didn't push some of it down, you know, I uh, I wouldn't be able to get out of bed. So you're literally just not thinking about you're at work. No, you can't. I can't think about my daughter when I'm at work. I I have to. Um, I have like five hours at work. That's a notebook zone. Like I don't let any. I don't think about any book promo stuff. I don't answer my publicist's emails. I don't talk to my publisher. I have nothing for at least five hours. I just have to focus on work. And the entire day, I, I can't really um, let myself investigate dyslexia, or else I would do it all day long. You know, I have to be strict with myself and, and put up some sort of boundaries, or else I'll just, you know, be so vulnerable to the world. I don't know how else to operate. Yeah, I turn it off. Wake up. Methods. Yeah, I, I have a lot of methods. I mean, I remember several years ago, I was running uh, the morning show on Kiss FM, um, the Kiss Wake Up Club. Do you guys remember that? Yes. Yeah. 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 For sure. Yeah. And I hated it. I hated it. I, I, I had to. I was part of the team responsible for waking up New York City. Tri-state area and having a time like this at six o'clock in the morning. It feels like that. At six o'clock, and it was tiring. It was emotionally draining. And you know they were laying people off. And you know, and when you're in radio, you can tell that your your show is um, in jeopardy when they start taking people away. First, it's the producer, then they start with other people, and sort of later it's you. And at this point, they had changed the whole team, and it was like DL Hughley, and it was like Jackie. It was like DL's guy, and it was me. And the station won't be there. DL won't be there. And we were having some tough times with ratings. You know how it goes with ratings? Don't look good. Somebody's got to go. I remember they called me into the office, and they're like, hey, our kids, yeah, we're going to take you off the show. And I was like, you're firing And they were like, yeah. And the HR person was there looking sad. My boss was your shoes. <laughs> and the radio, they don't really let you say goodbye to them. walk you out the door right then and there. And so they did. And, and, and I remember before that, literally, this is when I was married the first time as well. And I remember, <laughs> I hated it so much. We would have these meetings after the show. I would leave the show, we would sit in my car, and I would call up my husband at the time, and be like, I'm leaving. I hate it. He was like, You have a meeting, you can't leave. Well, I'm just leaving. I'm leaving. And it was, Go back upstairs. I'm like, Okay, I'll go back upstairs. <laughs> but I remember this particular day, 
I, I was so crushed. This is just one of the many things. It was a horrible time. And people didn't know that my ex-husband and I were going through a bad time. And I was like, we were separated. And I was like living down the street around the corner. You know, um, it was just horrible. I hated, I hated everything in my life. I remember that. I hated my hair. I had little dreadlocks. I hated everything. And I remember that one particular day, I just got in my car. And they're right on Hudson Street, you know. I'm not going to know it's on the management of the talk, so. um, But I drove to my mother's house. And I got out and I knocked on the door. And she's like, why are you here? And I just sat at the kitchen table and just like crying. Like, oh, I can't take it. And she was just looking at me like, because I've never really been one, at least at that time, to show emotion. You know, I've always I'm tough, I'm strong, I'm this, this, that. And I couldn't be tough and strong. And I just, I just cried. I just had to let that out, and I felt this pressure on me, and I just could, and I hated it, and I, I felt stuck, and so what I did was, what I began to do was a mixture of things. Um, making the practice of journaling. My best days are when I journal. I can tell my days are off if I don't get up and do certain things. Um, journal, visualize my day, how it's going to go in a positive way. Um, Meditating, it's a whole serious practice I had to do. I saw you guys, I was like, oh, I want to do that. Like, it was really nice, you know, journaling, meditating, affirmations. There's something in my novel, The Man Curse, where, you know, you know, I call it self help fiction with my protagonist, and she's going through these things in her life, and she leaves her job, and she's got this boyfriend that was a deadbeat and was really emotionally abusing her. Um, and when she actually begins to go to therapy, she begins a tactic of uh, an inner conversation with yourself uh, between the it and the ego, big and little, where it's this inner dialogue where she's literally right, where big is like her pet talk, you know, putting her in place, and little is like the, the it, saying whatever she wants, like, I can't, I can't stand this, I'm ugly, I'm this, I'm that, and big is like, no, you're not, it's gonna be all right. Literally having this internal conversation, we bring ourselves down, literally bringing yourself back up, so that's something that I want to talk a little bit about being Mary Jane, and a lot of us clearly relate to that character of a very high-profile, driven woman. Professionally, everything looks perfect. She's anchoring the show every day. Meanwhile, her personal life is in shambles, and she is also taking on so much in terms of supporting her family. And then we all remember, you know, her friend ended up committing suicide. But even the moments before that moment happened, where in the first episode, in the first season, she came to her house to prevent the first time she attempted to commit suicide. But still, in my, in my mind, those moments, they made me think, okay, and she still showed up at work the next day. And that's not something that you call out for, oh, I'm sorry, I can't come in today because my best friend is about to commit suicide, I just can't show up at work today. And so I want to talk to you, Kelly, because you're you know, behind the scenes on that show a little bit. Why is it important to show something like that on television? And what impact do you think that it has on society? Well, for starters, I had a hard time relating because my life is perfect publicly and privately. That's amazing. That's sarcasm. That's definite sarcasm. <laughs> I thought, I thought, okay. I thought that was perfect lives, right? And right. that was kind of... And, and I really believe when you get at the heart of it, that that's really why Mary Jane struck a chord, because of exactly what you said, which is so many of us, you know, have our perfect facade. And my mother was actually just telling me a story about someone we know whose family looked perfect, and then she was just finding out behind the scenes some of the real, very serious struggles that they have. And I know that there are people who really envy, you know, oh, why can't our family be more perfect like theirs? And, um, and that's why I believe Mary, being Mary Jane really struck a chord, um, because especially for women of color, it's even more complicated. Um, because as I've discussed with some of my white friends, you know, if you're white and you went to an Ivy League and your parents are middle class, it's very unlikely that someone in your immediate family lives in the projects, or even in a trailer park, right? That's very unlikely. But if you're black, it's very I mean, most of my black friends, you know, if you went to an Ivy League, you're looking for money to help the family member who didn't get to the Ivy League and who's working as a cashier and who's trying to buy their kids Christmas presents. And it's something none of us talk about. It's so interesting because I've had friends I've known for years who will then be like, oh yeah, my cousin got arrested again and my family's trying to help and it's causing all these problems and my parents are loaning money. And so 
I really believe that's why being Mary Jane struck the chord that it did, because so much of our representations for as people of color on air have not been complex. You know? We're also not just good times, right? And I think that being Mary Jane captured exactly what you're talking about is, which is it is possible for you to have the great job, the great career, the good parents, and still have you know a brother who's in a rehab and a family member you're trying to help support financially because she makes not great choices. I actually co-wrote the episode for at least a time of life. That was the kind of episode. And um, you know, then the speech, there's a speech actually that that Mary and Jane gives at the funeral where she talks about we loved it. Yeah. It was incredible. Thank you. If you can share a little bit about what the opening part was. Well what I was gonna say is it goes back to something Dina said, which is that she opens by saying I was at a gas station and someone asked me how I was doing and I said fine, which makes me a liar because it wasn't fine because of what happened to my best friend. But that's what we're all trained to do, is we're all trained to lie our way through life. If someone, you know, if you go, if we got walked out of here and ran to someone on the street we haven't seen in a year, and we said, how are you? And they said, terrible, my wife left me and I'm not even sure. We'd be like, what? You know, know, just looking to see if things are good, or, you know? And that's how we're all kind of trained. And so that's what I really wanted to get out with that speech, which is, everyone was going through the motions, even though they knew there were problems in that woman's life that were very serious. And no one wanted to talk about it because that's what we're all trained to do is to you know, mind business. And, and, then, and there are consequences when we bury things too much, which I'm not a fan of bury. Um, but it is, it, it, it's interesting, I mean, the whole concept when you asked for us to, to speak tonight, I was really mulling it over because um, I, you know, I'm torn on the whole concept of, of compartmentalizing versus not, and I, and I, and I was really thinking about mulling it over when I got the work, when, when we talked about me coming here, um, because one thing about being a writer is it's very hard to, to write. I feel, here's what I have personally found. I feel like there are two kinds of modes of being an artist. There's the Adele mode, which is pain is a great motivator. Right? And you can make, create some great, beautiful art. There are lots of artists too we know of who it's like, well, she, you know, she bad her marriage fell apart, but boy, that was a great album, Marie Franklin. You know, like that's, there's that. But then there's the other person who gets really, can't, you can't really do your best because you're not at your best right. mentally and psychologically. And so for me, it is very, I get distracted as a writer when I have stuff going on. Even more so when I'm worried about someone else. Like if I'm feeling concerned for someone, I get distracted as a writer. So I, you know what, so I was thinking about the, what your fundamental question was, which is well, how do you work through that? And one of the things I realized about myself is I hadn't thought about it until I was thinking about this whole larger question, but I think I put a lot of self-protection mechanisms in place in my life. And it sounds really funny, but this is a, an example, is if I'm having a stressful day, I won't take the subway if I can avoid it. Because being around people who may have their own baggage, right? And it has nothing to do with you, but like they had a bad day or they had a fight with it. And so you bumped into them on the subway and then it just turns into a whole thing. And you're like, I'm just trying to get where I'm going. I was already having a bad day. And you start yelling at me because I actually bumped into my umbrella, umbrella, you know? So I try to do like that. Um, it's also one of the reasons, though, that I love working from home. And I, and I try to be very protective about maintaining that, even as I write for other outlets and freelance, and it's actually one of the main reasons I've decided to kind of uh, maintain my freelance career when I've had other options, and we, I was in a great writer's room with Big Mary Jane, but there are certain fundamentals, like I'm a night owl, and so it doesn't matter how great the job is or how much it pays me, I'm not at my best if I'm at a job where you need me over at 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. I'm not at my best, <laughs> I'm not. And my editors would say that, like the writing, it comes quicker, it comes better. Oh my God, you're amazing. I don't. Oh, did you bring that? Oh, yes, I did. <laughs> I'm sorry. I don't, I, had, I was stressed and I don't drink alcohol, so she was like, I'm going to bring you coffee, so I appreciate that. Um, Amazing. But um, thank you so much. You're so sweet for that. Thank you. <laughs> this is officially my favorite event ever. But yeah, I try to do self, I feel like I do self-protection things like that because the writing doesn't get done if I am not in a good place emotionally. So if there are things I can do, like writing on a schedule that works for me emotionally and psychologically, and if that means writing till 4 a.m., then I don't apologize for that anymore. I just create a life where so I So you do don't that. feel guilty about operating in those hours? Sometimes when I'm operating in weird hours, I start to feel guilty. Like, I'm not, I shouldn't be up working at this time. I should be asleep, and I should be it's, on a normal schedule. It's so normal, really, but... 
It's so funny you said that because I remember, I don't want to say what it was, but there was something where I, I did have someone who wants email. I was like, why are you always sending so many emails? Like, and I was like, why are you awake? And I told someone else that story and they go, well, that person was basically saying, why are you making us look bad? Because you're like, up, oh, up. Oh, I, I literally know. use Boomerang, which is an app to schedule my emails. Oh, yeah, I'm about that. I don't look great. But can I tell you something? I love yeah. that and I need that. I need that. But let me say this that's one of those things where I do, I hate to sound so like, oh, who is still the age? But there's so many things to worry about, Mike, that if I'm sending you better material at 4 a.m. than I would send you at 8 a.m., why should you be concerned when I send it? And I have to tell you something, because I think this, because I remember I once, this is something that I did want to share about the whole, like, stress and delegating, and I think I said this in the email to you, is I have an assistant. I used to feel guilty about that. And one of the reasons I felt guilty about that is because there are people, quote, more famous than me who don't have assistants, right? And I once had an editor who said the words to me, you have an assistant, it's not like you're Oprah. Mm -hmm. wow. Yeah. And I was like, well, I, I know I'm not Oprah. No one's Oprah, it's not Oprah. <laughs> you know, like, I, I, you know, I know I'm not Oprah. I mean, you know, well, it was so, it was so nasty, right? It was so nasty. And I was really sore because how does one respond when someone says that? Right. And, um, and it was funny because I recounted the conversation. I said, you know, something just reminded me about Oprah, which I knew. It was weird. And, <laughs> and I went, oh, it was weird. That is, that's none of her business, right. and the fact that she's worried about that says that that's not someone mm -hmm. who's going to be a supporter of yours or championing you in your corner, and they weren't, and they, they showed their pleasure very quickly that this was someone who did not want to see to see. But my point is, the fact that I felt this guilt, it took me a couple years to get to a point to where I realized the reason I actually have an assistant is because she helps, with that saying, self-esteem's not thinking you're great at everything, it's knowing what you're great at. And I'm not great at the organization. I'm not great at the administration. I'm not great at submitting invoices. I'm not great at remembering that I'm supposed to be here tonight, not yesterday. And I remember the reason I actually hired an assistant is because I showed up at some place on the wrong day. It was at a gala. And I was like, where is everyone? And it was at the next night. And, I, and, the, and the security people were like, are you talking about that's tomorrow? And I was ready. I had my outfit on. And, and then I realized it. And, then, and even that didn't do it. I wasn't like, I'm getting an assistant. Night. What happened is two days later, I was on the phone with someone prominent, and I said, okay, well, I'm really looking forward to see you. I'll see you tomorrow. And he goes, you do realize it's next week, right? Like, oh, of course, of course. And I was like, oh, my Lord. So I go, Dad. So I went out and hired someone. So but my point is that what I need to be successful is no one else's business. Yeah, that's right. It's not. And I used to feel like, she's right, but maybe I shouldn't tell people I have a sister. I would keep it a secret. I'm not that bad. I'm not a sister. It's, but what we need to be successful, what works for you, as long as it's not harmful to anyone else, is not something you have to apologize for. And I used to do it, and now I'm just like, oh, can you call Ashley, my assistant, if she doesn't get it, I, I won't know to show up. So, yeah. so. Wow. So many amazing lessons in that moment, and thank you for being so honest and transparent here, because it's not easy, and all of you, seriously. I want to talk about something that I'm, I'm sure we all love, Beyonce. And in her album, Lemonade, there's a line where she's like, she grinds from Monday to Friday, works from Friday to Sunday. And that line really resonated with me. It made me think, okay, this whole concept of compartmentalizing and working hard, at what point does working become an excuse to avoid what's happening in our personal life? Uh, I did write an article uh, and publish it, so now I'm held to it, about never lying. <laughs> and it's called Two Years to No Lies, uh, about how it took me two years to figure out how to live in modern society, never lying. Never, and I mean never. It means like, how do I look? Why did you not invite me to your dinner party? Uh, <laughs> why are you not hanging out as much as friends? Like, it is no lying. Ever. It's even if you see that person uh, outside, and yeah, and they ask you how you are, it's, I'm okay, how are you? You know, it is, it's full on. Even, hey, let's meet up for lunch, like, uh, I might not be able to, because if I say yes, then I'm committed to it. 
And it, it's... And you did tell me that, actually. Yeah. Yeah, and you said, I don't, I can't do it right now. Okay, now I hear you. But you live great. Yeah, I mean, I do live by it. I do live my life. So don't ask me anything you don't want an answer to. But actually, I'm about to, I'm about to publish an article uh, in the next couple of days, because I actually think the honesty thing is only the first step. Uh, and this has come up with a couple of the things that the president's saying. It's just the first step. The second step is to have the authenticity with awareness. So it's the impact of what you're saying on the people around you. The lying part is honestly is very hard, but that's easier than to decide about whether you want to, when you want to say something, how you want to say it, how will it affect the people around you? Does it make the world? Does it make the world better? Um, don't hate me for saying this, but maybe one of the things we could we could learn through the authenticity with awareness is maybe to live a little more lightly. Don't hate me. But you know, if someone said that to you, and you're fully strong, like I don't need my validation else it's like yeah it's not bad or just a laugh oh so yeah. Happy Oprah? yeah or even on camera today maybe I mean it's much easier to quarterback this right but what if it's ah you know that was a long time ago what I wrote about today is X and then you just freaking do it yeah I mean it's hard right it's hard <laughs> no. it's hard no it's You're hard okay up. yeah it's yeah. so much easier setting up you know this is your profession yeah. I know, it's so much easier. Well, and also because the other one didn't want to let it go. Oh, really? No, no. I, it was, but, but I don't like who this person is about because it really was, I think, a producer fail on both for yeah, both of us. Yeah, yeah. Not just, it wasn't the game was me. And just the other thing about the telling the truth, I would love to tell the truth all the time. I'm a person who suffered from debilitating migraines since I was nine years old. Debilitating, I live right now. I was at a sign on Sunday and I left and I threw up. Sparkled the whole time. Wow. Left and threw up. Um, I, I don't remember my book launch party. There are, are many things I, I dazzle through and don't remember. Um, and if I were to tell the truth about how I feel, I, I would be telling people that I'm miserable all the time. There are people that are struggling with, with issues that are so huge and so weighty. It is so much deeper than how are you doing not so great. It's like, how are you doing? I am struggling to even stay here. Right. Do you know what I mean? So I think, um, I, I, I don't think we should make light of the, of the depths of our despair. So I think that we should have better coping mechanisms, but I, I don't think we should be glib about them. Well, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, what I think she's saying, I think you guys are almost saying, yeah, I think we are so sort of saying about telling the truth, but, but I think before you're telling other people the truth, you can't tell anybody else the truth until you tell yourself the right. truth. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's what it is. So right. that's where it begins. Like when you talk about working, you know, and, and working all day, that's being emotionally unavailable. That's an addiction. It's like, you know, people work, you know, some people drink. Some people do drugs, but it's all a way to feel a numbness and, 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 and to not feel those things right. that we're feeling. But it's when you feel those things, I tell women this, when I go to domestic violence shelters or women's groups and I talk about this, I say, you know, it's like a dark tunnel, right? The light is on the other end of that tunnel. You have to walk through that tunnel. That tunnel is the feeling of all of those emotions. It's not until you get through that tunnel, get to the light, that you can actually enjoy the light. You have to be brave. It's, it's, it's courage. And it's our fear that makes us not want to walk through that tunnel. That makes us work or drink or drug or do all of these different types of things. So when you're working, 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 yet you're avoiding, you know why? Because you don't want to go home to that empty house, probably. Yeah. Actually, let me agree wholeheartedly with what you're saying. Uh, I wrote this other piece recently about the cult of busy. Mm -hmm. And I realized literally today, I had a super rough day today too, like a super rough day. I was like ready to cry for four hours before coming here. Um, and you know what it was? I created stress in my life. In the two and a half hours before coming here, I agreed to give a free meditation at 10, but why did I agree to do that for free in the middle of the work day? And then I agreed to do a free thing for LinkedIn and Ray Hoffman, that was a live Skype thing. And that was also for free. Both of those were that, and this is all literally back to that, like with no time in between, and then running here, and I'm crying, I was late to Ted, and I was half an hour late to the same with Hoffman, and then, oh my god, and I was like, you know what, all of this is my fault, I have created chaos in my life, I, yes, I, I, I wrote an article about the cult of busy, 
busy and I created busy in my life. Yeah. And it was my stress level was so high today, and yeah, I wanted to cry. I'm so angry at myself and angry at like all this you know, free stuff that I'm doing. This is what we do though. It is an addiction. I don't drink, I don't do drugs, I don't eat sugar or gluten or soy or this. But I have an addiction to work. And to okay, well, that's the perfect way to end. Just to close it out, if everyone could just say one thing that they do to cope and to just build up your resilience so that you can face the things that you face. And then we're going to leave with you as the last person. I would like for you to explain about the path and what that is and how people can meditate and what that's about. Um, I have a practice I get up. I thank God for the day. I visualize my day. I just really work to see my day from beginning to end, how I want it to be. It's going to be a good day. And I journal and I meditate. I work to do these things every single day. And, and, and I, yeah, yeah, I, I do these things. I have affirmations. I write. I do a lot of things. I, I, I don't even I have my vision board on the wall. <laughs> you know, I'm looking it's right on my bed. I, I look and I look at my vision board. I read my goals, like these are practices, these are things that I do like you know, every day. I have to do these things. So, and then I have that, I literally journal that internal conversation with myself. That first part of journaling is just, eh, I gotta do this, I gotta do that. He's getting on my nerves. Then I have a different conversation, which is more, uh, once I get it all out, it's that internal conversation, you know, that big and little conversation. Um, it's in my book, but that's probably one of the real things that I really do in my life. Like having that conversation with myself, like we have to, like this stuff right here is healthy. Why? Because what? We're communicating, we're talking, but you also gotta go home, you gotta do these things with yourself. Baby. So that's something like that. I wanna be you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wanna be healthy like everybody else on the screen. I'm so <laughs> responsible. Yes. Um, you're a writer. I'm right, like, yeah, yeah, like, we are just comments. But, the, uh, you know, I don't think anybody should judge what anybody's coping mechanisms are. And mine is, and mine has been the same since I was eight years old, I come home and I rewrite the day. The fun thing about being a fiction writer is that you can elevate, and, like, the dialogue is better, the sex is cinematic, the, you know, like, it, nobody has exactly what you do a book, you know, and, <laughs> and, you know, like you think about the response that you wish you would have given when you're on the train, you know, yeah. like, you know yeah. God, why did I say yeah. that? So it is so cathartic for me to come home and just take a piece of the day and, and, and make it so much better than it was, you know, like make the conversation better, make the outfit better, make the guy better, make, you know, and it just, I fall asleep to my life. Because I just tickle myself. <laughs> so I don't know. Like I think whatever does that for you, whether it's baking something, I have a girlfriend who like comes home and strips her floors for no reason, you know, or like makes a table. Like does something with her hand, you know, like makes something that, that does it for her. Like whatever it is, do find out what it is and do that all the time. And Kelly, just one thing. I was one totally thing. so into what they were saying. What was the question again? Just one thing. <laughs> One thing that you do daily or we need to make sure that you have the strength to face, face the day, the coping mechanism, or? Well, well, the, the honest answer is I've actually, I, I've been notoriously bad at that throughout much of my life. I mean, one of the things that my, yeah, she's like, yeah, right, just a writer. Um, so I just want to own that. I was actually sick a couple weeks ago, my doctor said, what are you doing for stress management? I said, wow. Because she kind of knows that that's, and I'm one of those people who manifest it very physically, like I'll get a cold, or I, lose weight and that kind of stuff. So, so it is actually, to answering your question, the truth is, is it's work for me. Um, and part of why it's work for me though, is because I love what I do so much, that you make a lot of excuses you wouldn't if you had a boss in an office of a job you hate, mm -hmm. right? Like I, I, because I was trying to explain to her, but it's an election year, so it's not reasonable for me to sleep eight hours, you know? Like you can't expect me to sleep eight hours right now. And, and, um, and but I know that's not healthy, so what I, we go through the cycle because she said I see her more during election years, which is also an important thing to know that that's my dysfunctional pattern. Yeah. pattern. And, um, but so we're back to me reintegrating more healthy um, stress coping mechanisms in my life. And so I'm trying to be really disciplined about um, starting the day with a prayer. 
and just some gratitude, just some gratitude for so many wonderful things in my life, you know, because once you, because what I've noticed even in the few weeks I've been back to doing it is when you do that, it makes it really hard to then go complain about the bad things, you know, right? Like that morning to be like, oh, I have a lot of things to do about it. So reintegrating some form of prayer and the meditation, but focusing, you know, on gratitude during the day is what I'm trying to be better at. I'm not perfect at it, but I'm trying to. It's just to make me not be sick. So because of that, I don't get sick, which is nice. But I think the biggest thing for me is being in nature. And I know if my head starts feeling clogged and I can't think, and then I snap at someone, like your conditioner moment, I have those <laughs> every day, unfortunately. Uh, and then I go to nature for an hour, and I am back to the person that I like. <laughs> so that's a, that's a huge one for me. And it's like my feet have to be in the grass. So Union Square does not work right now. A lot of the parks, like Madison Square. Anyway, feet in grass. Um, and then, yeah, I'd love to invite you guys all to come to the path, uh, which is great for stress management. Uh, we sit every Tuesday evening at the Standard in the East Village, and it's stunning. We're the penthouse, and it's beautiful. The teachers are amazing. And it's fun and social, too. Uh, and then, yeah, we have all sorts of courses. Yeah, come to our retreat next weekend if you're interested. Anyway, we've got a whole bunch of stuff that happens. So I'd love to invite you guys to join our invitation list, which is at thepath.com, or come see me after. Um, yeah, it would be so fun to have a little reunion there. And we'll be sending out the information to everyone who would send it. Of course, I have all your emails. And first, yeah, let's... Bubble bath. I forgot that one. Which one? Oh, yeah. Bubble yeah. bath. Bubble bath. Yeah. Yes. I love a bubble well, bath. Well, first you need to have a bathtub to have a bath. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. so <laughs> Moving into an apartment with a bathtub, uh -huh. I always took them growing up and I forgot how much. You give me 20 minutes in a bubble bath in a Vanity Fair with a juicy, yeah. one, of, one of their great long uh -huh. investigative yeah. stories with like rich people committing yeah. crimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You can borrow a lot of money from me in the five minutes after I got some bathtub. Yeah. <laughs> One thing I do, one thing, Sundays I do not go on social media. I shut it down. Like, don't tweet on Sundays, guys. Just don't <laughs> tweet on Facebook, you know, nothing. Like, you just, I shut out the world. You have to. Yeah. Just yeah. shut out the world and just be with yourself. And we, we didn't get a chance to talk about this a lot, but Rakia is an activist, and so she can be at a book signing, but also tweeting about a protest that's happening, and I didn't get a chance to talk to you about that, but. Feel free, ladies, to ask her about that. I work with Amnesty. She went to Ferguson. Yeah. So, can we just give each of these ladies a round of applause?